thank you, thank you to all of you that are here in presence and also to the ones that are connected. And uh, welcome to, uh, to this uh, side event, Innovative Instrument for Joint Biodiversity and, uh, and Climate Policy that have been organized uh, by uh, Bocon University together with uh, the European Association of Environmental and Resource uh, Economies and the United Cities and Local Governments, uh, UCLG. I'm Benedetta Lucchitta, I'm a researcher at, uh, at Bocon University, and today I have uh, the honor to, to introduce the event and to co-chair this uh, outstanding panel of, uh, of speakers together with uh, uh, Professor Joseph Del Becke that uh, will join us, I think, uh, later. So before, uh, uh, before to leave the floor to, uh, to the speaker, I want just to say a few words to introduce the, the topic. Climate change and, uh, and biodiversity are two topics that are interconnected. And let's say that one uh, can influence the, the other. Since uh, from the first uh, mm -hmm. summit organized by, by the United Nations uh, in, in Rio in 1982, to the two conventions, the first con the Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on uh, uh, Biological Diversity, have been presented and opened for the signature to, uh, to all countries. But despite, let's say, this... Um, the recognition of the interlinkage between these two topics, the policy uh, that uh, have been implemented uh, since until now have, uh, have not been able to address uh, both issues, both crises uh, uh, together. In fact, uh, at the moment, few, ex uh, few effective examples of, uh, of policies uh, have, been, uh, have been implemented and to show uh, how to make uh, the best use uh, of, uh, of synergies and also to avoid trade-offs between uh, uh, climate and, uh, and biodiversity in respect to both uh, design and the implementation of, uh, of policies. In this context, the role of, uh, of private actors or private stakeholders uh, have gained a lot of relevance and uh, the, since they can influence uh, and change uh, the impact of the economy on the environment and also on, uh, on climate, also through the introduction of uh, voluntary instruments and through the creation of, uh, of new markets. Also, in, uh, in the last COP15, organized by the Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, there is there has been this call to, uh, to define innovative economic and financial instruments that are being able to, uh, let's say, leverage uh, private investment to, uh, to protect biodiversity and uh, to switch to a nature positive economy. So, having said that, uh, today uh, the speakers will try to shed light uh, on uh, the peculiar, on the innovative, uh, on, on the peculiar, uh, peculiarities of uh, innovative uh, uh, economic and financial instruments uh, that can, at the same time, enhance biodiversity, increase the resilience of territories, uh, and uh, and reduce uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions with particular attention on biodiversity credits uh, and, uh, and, off and offset, considering also different, uh, different scales uh, of, uh, of application in order to facilitate the engagement of, uh, of, different, uh, of different stakeholders to catalyze resources to protect biodiversity and uh, improve, uh, improve resilience. So, uh, now I will introduce uh, the speakers, and uh, the first, uh, uh, maybe I need that. <laughs> the, first, uh, the first speaker is uh, Simone Borghesi, that is uh, president uh, elected of the European Association of Environmental and, uh, and Resource uh, Economists, and uh, also professor at uh, EWI and University of, uh, of Siena. Just a 
second. Ah, okay, <laughs> I couldn't see it in the screen. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Not in my Biodiversity Yard. Uh, funny title and I hope you understand why in a second. And I want to focus on the tensions and synergies between biodiversity and climate change. As you know, climate change has uh, negatively affected biodiversity in the last decades. In the past 50 years, it has contributed to a massive decrease in wildlife, 69% according to WWF. If global warming is to rise up to four degrees Celsius, half of all plant and animal species are at risk according to the IPCC. And one fourth of all species uh, will be forced to migrate according to IPBS. Moreover, the lack of genetic diversity makes crop more vulnerable, which causes food, food, food uh, security at risk. All these have a huge economic value uh, and cost. Uh, the World Economic Forum estimates that $44 trillion of economic value generation depends on ecosystem services and therefore might be at risk because of biodiversity loss. For this reason, the European uh, institutions have implemented biodiversity policies uh, in the last few years. And I refer mainly to the European nature restoration law that aims at ecosystem protection and restoration, especially uh, as far as the capacity to capture carbon and reduce natural disaster impacts are concerned. The restoration law aims at achieving at least 20% of EU land and sea areas being protected by 2030 and all ecosystems in need of restoration being protected by um, 2050. A particular important role is played by soil in this context. It's a critical problem because uh, between 60 and 70% of the European soils are estimated being unhealthy and 50 billion euros are lost every year due to soil degradation. Healthy soils are key for a bunch of reasons. Climate neutrality, halting desertification and land degradation, uh, slowing down at least the pace of biodiversity loss, providing health food and so providing health to mankind. For this reason, the EU soil strategy for 2030 was set to achieve healthy soils by 2050. These policies, however, have been criticized by some sectors, some productive sectors or some parties in Europe for mainly uh, two reasons. They compete with other alternative, possibly more profitable land uses. And that is why it has been argued that biodiversity protection can cause economic damages. The attitude that I have seen uh, when discussing with some um, uh, policymakers, in, in, that was the case, uh, it was, okay, nice, biodiversity, but not here, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we are happy if it's done elsewhere. And this is why I think this might create a, what I call the new NIMBY syndrome, where the, the acronym stands in this case not for not in my biodiversity yard. Now, the idea of delocalizing policies is also in other contexts, for instance, for carbon offsets and voluntary carbon markets. And I currently direct a project at EUI called Life Coast that looks also at these aspects. The idea, as you know, is that hard to abate sectors may offset their uh, residual emissions by purchasing carbon credits that are generated elsewhere. And this is absolutely a reasonable idea, since we are talking about global warming, and so it's a global problem. It doesn't matter where you abate, as long as you abate. However, lately, these carbon offsets have been criticized. The quality has been questioned. If you look at this map by the Carbon Brief, 
you see the location of offsets that have been criticized for affecting indigenous people, affecting food production, overestimated offsets or illegal land use. And as you see at first sight, they are all located in Latin America and, and Africa, most of them. So affecting developing countries in particular. And indeed, the reports of carbon offset projects causing negative impacts in the last five years have been dominated by Latin America and African cases. Along with carbon offsets, also biodiversity offsets have been promoted. Uh, in this case, it is the economic value of an habitat, of plants or animal that provides the credit to offset other damages. Biodiversity offsets have been uh, identified as an instrument to finance the global deal for nature, as envisaged by the COP15 Biodiversity Summit. But even in this case, some critiques have emerged that are identical, if not worse, uh, with respect to those cases of carbon offsets. Low levels of monitoring governance, high cost, the difficulty to ensure permanence in the effects of these projects, lack of regulation, environmental justice, or better, injustice towards the local communities. These are all problems that have emerged in these cases. So while, again, I want to stress these are potentially useful tools, we should be very careful in their implementation because they can run into severe implementation problems if they are not properly regulated. <coughs> what I have presented so far just already gives the idea of the tensions between climate and biodiversity. Uh, tensions that occur also for other reasons. For instance, large solar power installations or offshore wind farms may alter the habitat of land and, and marine species. Moreover, monoculture afforestations tend to damage biodiversity. At the University of Siena, I'm currently uh, directing a, a group within the Agritech project that looks at these aspects, and we are studying the case of bamboo. Bamboo is a very interesting case because it has high carbon absorption capacity, grows very fast, but it's also an invasive species. So the fact that it grows very fast is good for carbon policies, but bad for biodiversity. That's a good example of trade-off. But we can also have synergies, and we should also uh, focus on the synergies. Biodiversity protection mitigates negative effects of climate change through soil health and soil stability, as I was saying before, limiting the uh, spread of diseases and pests, protecting, therefore, human and crop health, and also preventing or mitigating natural disasters. For this reason, I think we should try to mitigate the tensions that exist and try to stress on, uh, and focus and stress the synergies. Trade-offs exist. Let's be uh, honest and frank. But in my view, there are not good reason to slow down the biodiversity policies. And this uh, attitude that I was mentioning before, I think it's uh, um, a, a problem. We are passing from not in my backyard to not in my biodiversity yard, as I was saying. And on the contrary, I think we should, uh, you know, promote biodiversity policies at the, also at the local level, which transforms the NIMBY syndrome in something positive. So having actually more nature in my backyard, in my view, should be the way to go. But obviously, it may sound like, like utopia, but if we understand the health, economic, and ecological uh, consequences of protecting biodiversity, it shouldn't be seen like that. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Simone, and my apologies for being somewhat late. I was in the other uh, side of the premises. So I would uh, like to uh, introduce um, Eduard Croci, who is Professor of Practice and Director of Sustainable Urban Regeneration Lab at Bocconi University. And uh, I think that um, uh, Eduardo is going to uh, tell us more about policy instruments. So um, Eduardo, you have the floor. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I have a presentation, so I think uh, 
should be uploaded. I, I love it yeah. for you. Or maybe I have to move, uh, to move here. <laughs> So I can start. I will go um, on uh, with respect to, to what Simone said, looking in particular at the role of cities, so at the local level. And uh, first of all, we are all aware that nature-based solutions uh, generate uh, several services. This is a very interesting characteristic uh, because all these ecosystem services uh, uh, provide a different kind of uh, of, uh, of services, uh, in particular they can be divided into three broad categories, uh, provision like food or wood, uh, regulatory for example the, the cycle of uh, water or other cycles and cultural uh, which all uh, are relevant for uh, our welfare. Uh, here we consider uh, six main kinds of natural based solutions at the urban level, urban parks, urban trees, uh, green walls, uh, uh, sustainable urban drainage, uh, green roofs, uh, and urban wetlands, and you see uh, how they generate uh, several kind of ecosystem services. Uh, many of these ecosystem services are directly or indirectly linked to climate, to both climate mitigation and to climate uh, adaptation. Uh, here you can see that in terms of uh, uh, mitigation benefits, there is uh, uh, sequestration and storage of carbon, uh, reduction of energy use of buildings, uh, reduction of water use, uh, facilitation, facilitation of active mobility, for example, while on the adaptation side there are several co-benefits uh, like uh, reduction of heat stress, uh, uh, like uh, mitigation of flooding, improving health, uh, improving air quality, and uh, promoting uh, biodiversity. Um, Economists, like uh, I and Simone are, uh, like to provide an economic value of these ecosystem services. So passing from uh, uh, physical stocks uh, to flows of services and then uh, valuing these kind of services with different techniques. Uh, actually, there are different methodologies based on direct and indirect value on cost reduction or insurance value of these services. And in a recent uh, uh, work by, by Bocconi University with uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, we estimated uh, some uh, specific services of uh, a few nature-based solutions. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, urban parks, uh, urban forests, uh, uh, green roofs, uh, green walls, and uh, urban orchards. And you see the, the final, the total, is uh, the value in euros uh, per year per meter, which uh, uh, varies between, uh, let's say, in the range 10 to 100 euros, uh, which is uh, a very relevant range. This is only a preliminary work that indicates uh, the relevance in terms of economic term of this kind of services, where urban uh, heat island effect uh, contrast uh, is here considered as the most valuable. <clears throat> now passing to instruments uh, to enhance nature at urban level, and to generate value, uh, we can divide the instruments into two broad categories, planning and regulatory instruments like uh, uh, zoning, standards, uh, offsets, and the economic and market instruments uh, like uh, subsidies and tax deductions, uh, fees, charges, and levies, uh, payment for ecosystem services, and credits, uh, uh, which I will focus uh, uh, on in the last part of my presentation. These instruments are normally used by municipalities for uh, uh, territorial development and for urban regeneration, uh, which are uh, the, the two uh, main situations to use them. Um, as I said, I will concentrate on, uh, on credits, and here we can make a division between nature-based uh, carbon credits and uh, uh, biodiversity or nature carbon credits. Uh, they should be distinguished be before because of their focus. We have several different definitions in literature at, at the moment, so we really need also to have uh, standard definitions. But looking at nature-based carbon credits, well, 
their goal is uh, to reduce, uh, to, reduce uh, to, to sequestrate CO2 in the atmosphere. So they, they are an instrument for mitigation. Uh, they should be measurable. Uh, they should be able to verify emission reduction. Uh, and they are generated by several projects in land use, uh, forestry, and uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, you can have these state topologies of credits looking at climate, climate finance instruments at least at three levels. Uh, the international level, uh, starting from the Kyoto Protocol with the Clean Development Mechanism, and then now it should be Article 6.4 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, they are admitted in several uh, domestic regulated markets like the Californian cap and trade, and uh, there is also the, the most relevant part, which is uh, uh, independent credits, uh, verified emission reduction generated under voluntary initiatives, which now make uh, most uh, of the market. Uh, this kind of, uh, of credits uh, uh, should, be, uh, should be positive in terms of <coughs> results uh, on affected communities and ecosystems, should be positive in terms uh, of uh, impact uh, on sequestering CO2 and should be uh, relevant in terms of integrity and robust governance, which is an issue, as it has been said. Uh, if we look at credit, uh, carbon credit issued in uh, the period 2015-2019, well, in that period, after that, there were some variations. Uh, the two top credits are credits generated by forestry and by the renewables. As you can see, so there is a high demand uh, for these kind of credits uh, generated by different sources. Uh, now passing to biodiversity credits, they are measurable, verified, and traceable units, uh, quantify the benefits not for carbon in this case, but for biodiversity. So it is a, a different metric, and they should produce a natural positive outcome, and I will explain this in, uh, in the next slides, uh, through uh, restoration and preservation of uh, nature. They should uh, uh, be measurable uh, with respect to a certain baseline. They should be verified by a third independent party. Uh, they should be accounted in a quantifiable way, and they should be uh, tradable in terms of uh, uh, finding a market where to trade them with uh, determined rules. Uh, there is also another let's say, a third category of credits, uh, which is hybrid credits. Uh, these credits can be generated by nature, both for carbon and biodiversity benefits. There is a lot of debate on this topic now, also to consider if this kind of, cre of, of uh, solutions should generate uh, two different kinds of credits or joint credits. And looking specifically at uh, these uh, biodiversity credits, uh, uh, the market is really at the initial stage, uh, even if uh, uh, there are several different standards, but this is typical of initial, initial stage. And as I said, we need standardization. Uh, we need uh, uh, to standardize these kind of units. Uh, and uh, we are now in this, uh, uh, in this phase where uh, the private sector is uh, leading with different programs, uh, but also there are independent standards and sometimes uh, there are also uh, government-led programs, so uh, credits generated by different sources. Uh, if we look at biodiversity credits, uh, as I said, they should be nature positive, which means go going beyond uh, offsets. Uh, offsets are used for compensate. You create a damage to nature, you compensate it uh, through, uh, through offsets. In the case of uh, biodiversity credits, the outcome should be positive, uh, which means you have to go beyond this and generate a positive impact, also considering, in some case, historic diffuse and an attributable impact uh, in this sense. Um, as I said, uh, I, I focus on uh, the urban level, which, of course, uh, uh, is a relevant one, even in terms of potential. And uh, looking at the, the four categories of instruments I mentioned before, I make some very quick examples on subsidies and tax deductions. Uh, for example, in Hamburg, there are subsidies for the installation of green roofs, uh, which reduce public costs of stormwater and, and flood management. Uh, in, uh, in the UK, for example, in Putney Wimbledon, uh, near London, 
there are taxes uh, on citizens uh, living close to parks uh, because of increase uh, in the value of their properties and other kind of benefits they receive. Uh, in the case of credits, uh, for example, in Washington, there is a credit exchange program uh, for uh, stormwater uh, runoff where, uh, where real estate developers uh, uh, must buy this kind of credits. Uh, in the case of Milan, there are payments for ecosystem services, for example, for the implementation and maintenance of urban green areas. To, to, con to conclude, uh, uh, what are the main challenges to scaling up nature finance? Uh, lack of standardized data, metrics, and frameworks, uh, need to integrate biodiversity into key decision making, uh, absence of effective policy support, uh, therefore, bankable biodiversity projects, uh, uncertain environmental integrity of offsets, uh, insufficient uh, industry and local community buy-in, uh, which uh, should define the solutions, uh, where, of course, uh, academia, uh, public uh, governments, uh, but also international actors and NGOs uh, can contribute. Uh, finally, uh, here this is a recent book uh, uh, which uh, Benedetta Lucchitta and I edited uh, on the topic of uh, nature-based solutions at the urban level, which can provide uh, interesting insights on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. And there is uh, two elements that I would like to highlight in what you were saying, is that the co-benefits are worth serious value, 10 to 100 euros. You know, so that's uh, important. And then also the kind of uh, credits beyond offsets, as you were putting it. Now, we have Eva uh, Meyerhofer from the um, European Investment Bank. She is uh, responsible for head uh, or is head of environmental policy and lead biodiversity specialist. Eva, very eager to hear from you how you as a policymaker looks at uh, the wealth of information that Eduardo just has been uh, putting forward. And I don't know whether you have slides. If no, so, we don't. yeah, you don't. Okay, thank you very much. So, Eva, we are looking forward to your intervention. Thank you uh, very much. And um, yes, uh, I think a lot has been has been said, and I'll come uh, at this as a multilateral development bank. So, looking at it from that perspective, um, I think we are emerging uh, from decades of a grow now, clean up later a mindset, and it has uh, has had um, it, it, it's run its course in a way, but and. What, was, what is very interesting and what we've heard from both Simone and Professor Croce is uh, that nature is no longer uh, at the fringes of, de of the development agenda, whether we are talking about within Europe or uh, outside of uh, the EU, uh, but it is at the heart and as reflected in the commitments uh, at the latest uh, UN General Assembly, uh, t uh, today's, I mean, the COP28, uh, certainly it has been really, really um, uh, strident uh, in, in all the discussions. So nature is part of the, uh, the, the discussion. Um, and of course, COP15 uh, on biodiversity. And so indeed, if we look back at the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, it spells out the global plan to protect nature and make sure it can be a long-term engine of jobs and growth, resilience, uh, just transition, while helping to reduce carbon emissions. So our world must not only become net zero, but also nature positive, a term that both Professor Croci and Benedetta um, uh, kind of mentioned, but what does it actually mean? It is a real paradigm shift uh, in how nations, businesses, investors, and consumers view nature. It is a disruptive uh, notion because in the past, the mantra among growing numbers of inspired leaders has been to do less harm, so all having our safeguard policies, uh, looking at the mitigation hierarchy, to reduce impact and tread lightly across our world. But of course, this mantra remains. It is still an important part of, let's say, what we call nature finance or the, uh, the mitigation part. But there is now a, vo a worldview um, gathering pace, and nature positive forces us to think differently about our place in the world. It becomes the foundation of good governance, long-term stable societies, uh, resilient societies, just societies, and healthy economies. And so it's a business model based on regeneration, resilience, and recirculation, and not on destruction and pollution. So how do we support this? 
Um, one is investing, I think we've, we've heard quite often, in data and analytics. And one reason why is this important is the public good dimension of nature-based solutions. Implementing and financing nature-based solutions is subject to a range of specific market failures, barriers including shortfalls due to the lack of data on the benefits and the trade-offs. We've heard that also a couple of times. Um, skills and expertise and lack of awareness of the general public. So there's not an understanding of the actual cost and the benefits of these uh, uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, something that I think uh, Professor Croci, or I can't remember, was it Simone? No, it was Simone who mentioned that. A lack of coherence amongst all the different policies. There is an incoherence in our policies. So we need that coordination uh, across the public agencies. And therefore, you need also an understanding and measuring of the value of nature is fundamental. Uh, fundamental and we should capture that in order, in our balance sheet, uh, to make the right decisions and make sure that those right decisions are taken not only at board level, but also within, uh, within the public sector and defining the right policies. We, of course, need to expand the coalition of partners committed to nature positive development. Uh, partnerships are extremely important. And there has been, um, uh, within the uh, multilateral development bank reform agenda, that the multilateral uh, development banks do get together. And some, some of the work that we've, uh, we've been looking at is um, how do we um, work better within this whole system looking at pro probably the development of climate and development country-led platforms. And within those platforms, we would be able to look at more impactful types of instruments to deliver and support our countries in delivering on their uh, NDCs and their climate as well as nature commitments. Um, but we need to move beyond conservation alone. And much of the attention around the global biodiversity framework has focused on the 30% uh, to protect you know, global land and seas. Um, but we also need to intervene in the other 70% of the productive, uh, uh, productive nature and productive landscape. That's where financial institutions are most active. You can, of course, protect. That's mostly done through grant financing. But looking at uh, the whole concept of biodiversity credits, the restoration agenda, it's in the productive landscape. And uh, this has a number of challenges because one of the, the targets under the Global Biodiversity Framework, Target 19, and there's been an ask, of course, uh, under the 10-point action plan uh, as well from the G20 uh, and the G7 for multilateral development banks to scale up financing at speed and at scale. Um, this is very challenging. And so we are right now focused often on the quantity of finance needed. And we agree it can, needs to come from all different sources. So what are some of the instruments that we can be used? We've heard uh, all uh, the work that's been done around uh, you know, the voluntary carbon market, biodiversity credits. Um, there's work done together with the World Economic Forum and the uh, led by the World Economic Forum and the Pollination Group on the biodiversity credits. But there are other instruments that, as financial institutions, we uh, we are looking into because it's not only about the quantity of finance; it's the quality of finance. And how and the advantage of financing and supporting nature-based solutions is that you actually have multiple objectives. You have uh, meeting uh, development and not a number of SDGs. You are also meeting climate objectives and you're meeting nature objectives. So how do we get that quality of finance? When we look at, uh, uh, I think, uh, the, the, not only the global south, but uh, those countries that are most impacted by climate change, those are the most vulnerable and they are often the countries that have very high debt. So how do we, let's say, look at um, creating a fiscal space that they do not have to look at this trade-off, so do I go and finance education, health, or can I actually meet my, my nature and climate commitments? So there are a number of instruments that are being developed and looked at and that are being scaled up, and notably the credit, uh, credit enhancement instruments, such as debt for nature conversions. And this is something that you create the fiscal space 
for these countries to be able to invest in nature-based solutions that both uh, help them have that impact at scale to meet uh, climate and nature objectives. And that is very important. And it doesn't increase debt. There are challenges. I think we've heard a number of the challenges of having a robust governance framework and a, a robust uh, monitoring and verification framework against a number of sustainability indicators and policy uh, triggers. But this is probably one way to go. The other uh, aspect uh, that I just wanted to, uh, to mention is that um, I think it was yesterday, the multilateral development banks launched the common principles for nature positive finance. So we have a set a bar for ourselves as to what we understand under nature positive finance, which is the last, let's say, uh, element of the overall nature finance. It's not about mitigation finance. Um, it's not about offsetting. It is really, let's say, uh, the additionality. And I'll just give you the, the, the definition of uh, nature positive finance, and that refers to finance that supports actions that protect and restore or enhance sustainable use and management of nature, or enables these actions contributing to the implementation of the Kunming uh, Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and broad ambition to halt and reverse nature loss by 2030 with a view to full recovery by 2050. And it has to meet three main criteria. I, one is to make substantive contribution to nature, has expected positive outcomes for nature that are measurable and can be assessed and monitored against a baseline where, of course, it's feasible or a business as usual scenario, and is not expected to introduce significant adverse environmental risks or impacts. Very similar, in a way, to uh, the objectives under Taxo, uh, Taxo 4 of the EU taxonomy. So you, in, in terms of its construct. But this is a game changer, in a way. Um, and this is going to put, um, let's say, create a baseline for the MDBs that can be used, that, that will be looked at from, uh, from or, or allow for comparability in terms of the type of financing that we are providing to, uh, to the Global South, or in our case also to, to the EU. But um, also, it will allow investors to ensure, okay, if they follow those common principles, those principles are robust, uh, and therefore also allows a certain um, uh, a standard to be set out uh, uh, on the market. There's then one last thing is uh, that uh, we shouldn't forget pollution. It's actually a triple uh, ecological crisis. So it's climate, nature, or biodiversity loss, and pollution. And pollution is causing 9 million premature deaths per year, 95% uh, of these in low and middle income countries. And pollution actually is an excellent entry point for us to be supporting uh, and ensuring financing um, uh, or reducing the drivers of biodiversity loss. And this is where you know, we need to look it will always be niche if we are looking at financing biodiversity on its own. So let's look at all these different entry points, support the transition, and use the instruments that we have at our uh, disposal. We are mostly infrastructure financing banks, and therefore some of our instruments that we have are not geared, and I think it was uh, Simone who, who mentioned that, is how do we uh, actually provide financing to the really those custodians of nature, to those communities that actually manage uh, nature. And so we need to rethink and tweak the financing instruments that we have so that indigenous communities local communities have that access to finance. And that is now the next challenge, is how do we make that flow of financing to those, when you think about it, where 80% of the high biodiversity value areas are on indigenous people's land. So a big challenge ahead of us. I think we are on the right track. Um, and I think the discussions around all those different financial and economic instruments um, to make sure that there is not a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of momentum from the capital markets, uh, but we do need to be careful. We need those robust frameworks in and around. But again, the enemy uh, of, uh, of, let's say, 
um, being perfect can be the enemy of the good, and uh, therefore we should still nevertheless start and not wait until we have the perfect framework in place. So I'll stop there and uh, pass on back to Ross. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Eva. Um, I, I agree with what you concluded, uh, that uh, the, the, the perfect, uh, being perfect is the enemy of the good. And what you mentioned, and perhaps we can store that for the debate, is this common principles that you were discussing over the last few days with the MDBs as a common baseline. That is a bit uh, resembling the taxonomy that yes. we have been developing in Europe. So apart from the credits that we have been you know, discussing, I think that this uh, kind of uh, disclosure of information and transparency may be useful for the discussion later on. Thanks very much. Let's move to Andreas. Andreas Kantolion is Professor of Environmental Economics and Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. So, Andreas, you're going to speak from closer to the computer. Um, I think that's a, a good idea because you may have slides you want to share. So, um, Andreas, uh, we would look uh, very much forward uh, on your thoughts, in particular also on the uh, carbon offsets. You know, I think that was mentioned uh, repeatedly and how to build further from there. You have the floor. Is the technology working? It is. It is. Okay. It is. Okay. Well, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me in this panel. Uh, I come to you speaking as a, a professor of economics, so more from the academic's uh, point of view. And uh, I've worked on uh, these uh, nature-based voluntary offsets uh, for about uh, 10 years now. Um, as my title indicates, uh, my talk will focus on whether these offsets are so-called lemons. Lemons we call in economics products that have an inherent embedded uncertainty, quality uncertainty in them, and that causes markets in these particular products to uh, uh, malfunction. And I want to ask, based on my research, whether these offsets have lemon characteristics. Now, I've worked uh, mostly uh, using em empirical methods, using surveys, satellite data in, in uh, various tropical countries. Uh, on a lot of these offset uh, uh, programs. The work I do is very technical. Today, I, it's, you know, it's late in the, in the day, uh, the, you know, the last day of COP. I won't go into technicalities. I want to focus more on kind of uh, big picture issues uh, concerning the viability of uh, these uh, biodiversity um, carbon offsets. Uh, I also should uh, clarify that I'm uh, limiting my, uh, my comments and my discussion on the so-called uh, decentralized uh, red plus uh, projects. These are voluntary schemes in the voluntary carbon market. Um, they are largely unregulated uh, projects. Um, and of course, they are nature-based. I think this is the reason I'm, I'm part of this panel. The number of offsets to be traded uh, from a particular project has to be verified by someone. And there are these verification agencies. Um, and uh, VERA, for example, is, is, uh, is one of them. Now, how do these verification agencies uh, come up with these uh, uh, credits. Well, in essence, they have different methods, but in essence what they do is they estimate a scenario of, uh, uh, of, of amount of deforestation, expected deforestation, in a, a business as usual scenario, without that is the offset project, and then they take the difference with what would have happened, what happens rather uh, when it comes to uh, deforestation when you do have the project, and that difference gives us the amount of carbon that we can save, if you like, that we can re uh, uh, preserve in, in the trees which we save, and this, uh, this amount of carbon then is uh, allocated in, in terms of, of carbon credits. But these crediting baselines is where the, the, the crux, the, the heart of the uncertainty lies, because these crediting baselines are projections, right? They're not uh, facts, right? The, these companies have methods to somehow um, project into the future what they expect things could turn out if we do not have an offset program. And this is where the, the kind of the core of the lemons problems might emerge. Now, if you look at this market, we see that it is, at least there's uh, uh, kind of projections that it is booming. About a couple of years ago, in 2021, we saw 
uh, a big spike in this market in terms of its market value, uh, and there are projections of how far this can grow. So right now it's, a, it's around the two billion mark, okay? But there are projections that it can go to 200 billion. There are other projections that it can go to one trillion by, uh, by Bloomberg, for example. So various numbers are being circulated. I, you know, again, these are just projections, but we're talking about huge, huge amounts of, uh, of uh, trade volume, okay? On the supply side, now we have a lot of players with, that have different vested interests, okay? Uh, and these could be, of course, the verifiers, but then you have all this array of kind of consultants, project uh, uh, carbon brokers, carbon traders, even carbon speculators, okay? And of course, the project developers themselves, these companies who develop these carbon offset projects. Now, um, at the same time, we see that there's a rise in skepticism from the media, policy circles, and of course, even in academia. Uh, this January, The Guardian ran a story uh, which got a lot of uh, attention and caused a lot of stir. And the headline of the story was that uh, over 90% of these credits are worthless in terms of their actual carbon emission reductions. I happen to be one of the uh, co-authors of the two main articles, the scientific articles that the Guardian story um, was, uh, was based on. Um, and uh, this kind of, the, the, the Guardian article is uh, not alone, it's not a standalone uh, uh, piece in the media. To the opposite, there's a lot of uh, um, kind of a bad press, if you like, lately on offsets, but also through adv advocacy groups, uh, the likes of, you know, uh, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, they've made statements uh, quite strongly against uh, carbon offsets. One point I want to make is that um, a lot of these advocacy groups, and maybe even perhaps part of the media, they come in from a more ideological perspective. They have kind of an ideological aversion almost against uh, carbon offsets, as, 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 uh, as um, you know, they oppose market solutions more generally, right? I, as an economist, I don't have a problem with, mar with market solutions, and that's not the issue. Um, but I think this is one of the, the, the problems we kind of, we, we mix up issues to do with uh, ideology and politics with efficacy. Do, do actually these carbon offsets work or not, okay? Okay? Now, I think more helpful to analyze whether these can work or not is to see them in, in this prism of, of lemons, okay? And to do that, we can refer to this article by um, the uh, Nobel uh, Prize laureate, uh, George Akerlof, uh, titled The Market for Lemons, Quality and Certainty, and the Market Mechanism, which was published in 1970 in the QJE. I've been told it is the most downloaded article in economics, okay? So that's an achievement beyond the Nobel Prize for uh, Professor Akerlof. Now, uh, in this article, using the example from the second-hand uh, market, um, Akerlof details the conditions for markets to fail under quality and certainty, in the absence, of course, of any institutional or policy support. And these include things like, buyers cannot assess the quality exante of the product. There are sufficient sellers available that have perverse incentives to offload poor quality products. There's no credible quality disclosure tools. If there was available, the sellers would use it. Third-party quality assurances are deficient. Now, the nexus of these, uh, it's a rather, the, the toxic nexus of these um, conditions could lead to a sufficient number of offsets becoming of poor quality, and that in, in, in turn triggers a, um, almost like a snowball effect that can bring down the market. That is the problem. It's not that all of the offsets have to be bad, but if a sufficient number of offsets, almost like a tipping point, are poor, that can lead to this, uh, to this uh, lemons problem. So the, the lemons theory, if you like, gives us insights to analyze, I think, this situation more clearly. How has the market reacted now to all of this kind of sentiment that we got from the media? Well, the financial uh, media uh, now openly refers to these uh, offsets as junk assets or stranded assets uh, or greenwashing. When I was interviewed uh, from an, on, after um, a science article that was published in uh, this uh, August, most of the journalists from the financial media were asking the question whether these products are stranded assets. This is what they want to know my opinion about, which I don't, I don't really know, but they, w they want to know, okay? And that's how they perceive these things, as being almost like junk bonds, okay? Uh, and that's, again, their, their words, not mine. Uh, we also see companies are facing lawsuits against their net zero claims based on offsets. KLM, Delta Airlines are being taken to court on the basis of uh, advertising uh, campaigns they've been running that they're net zero on the basis of these uh, uh, carbon uh, nature-based solution offsets. Uh, regulators in the EU, in North America, are now looking into passing new legislation prohibiting offset-backed net zero claims by the industry, by businesses. Many large corporations, uh, Nestle for example, are stating that they will phase out buying offsets. 
uh, we've seen the prices of nature-based offsets plummeting. Uh, they're selling at now below a dollar per ton, okay, which is very, very low to provide incentives for uh, this kind of win-win conservation. So are we seeing a correction in the market? Um, going back to the 2021 years of the boom, or is there a deeper problem that maybe we're heading towards a lemon situation where the whole thing could basically collapse like a, like a stack of cards? Um, so um, I, I'm a believer in carbon offsets. I think they have a role to play in carbon mitigation, uh, but certain things have to change, and I think even the industry understands this. The first thing is that we need more independent research on the determinants of success. Research tells us that not all offsets are of poor quality. Some are successful, so we need more work to understand why some offsets work. One area which is highly under-researched, and I'm speaking now as a social scientist, is what do offsets do to people? There's a lot of research on what offsets do to trees, these carbon-based offsets, but uh, much less on what it does to local communities. And that is instrumental for the success of these offsets. Also, we need industry initiatives, and, uh, and uh, we do see encouraging signs there. Things like new frameworks for estimating crediting baselines, the likes of Vera, to their credit, they're trying to reformulate their methodologies. We see new watchdog type of bodies uh, that want to ensure credibility of offsets. For example, this uh, Integrity Council that uh, got a lot of publicity and it was also um, present here in COP28 as well, is, is, is an example of a kind of an in, a sort of independent or potentially independent watchdog that can ensure credibility. Uh, we have now the emergence of kind of private sector rating agencies uh, which are in the business of providing a kind of a risk profile for these offsets. And that could also be a, a kind of a, a useful addition to this market. We see governmental and intergovernmental regulatory frameworks emerging uh, to um, uh, regulate these type of uh, uh, markets. However, there are looming dangers and challenges. And the most important one is that we have persistent perverse incentives. Okay? We have these many players and they have different incentives. Uh, both on the supply and on the demand side. And if these things are not taken care of, then this critical mass of poor quality offsets could emerge, triggering potentially this snowball effect that I've been uh, talking about, uh, which could totally bring down the market. It could continuously undermine the viability of the offset market and its potential to help with climate change mitigation. We can and we should introduce uh, 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 legislation. Uh, this is a highly unregulated area. Markets have to be regulated, so we, there is scope for more regulation. But the issue is, if we do introduce regulation, there could be a cost uh, that the offset industry might have to pay. And, the, and that cost comes in the, the loss in terms of the scale that they want to achieve. Okay? So what we, we might end up with is, yes, a reformed industry that produces and sells higher quality offsets, okay? But the volume will be much smaller. It will be a leaner, perhaps a meaner uh, market, more effective. It will lead to more, potentially more sustained flows of financial capital to the communities in the tropics. Uh, and it could actually make an actual dent on climate change mitigation. But it will be a much smaller thing than this sort of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of, um, of offsets. And again, this is just an idea or a, a sort of a, some thoughts based on my research. You know, no one really knows exactly what's going to happen with this. These are just, this is a kind of a, a space which is evolving. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andreas, to sketch out, you know, what the problems are since the Guardian brought out, you know, the, uh, the problems with the, with the voluntary carbon market and the need for regulation. I think that's a very pertinent question that could come up later in our discussion as well. I think it was indirectly you know, mentioned by, by all of us. Um, let's move on to Alina Kosmider, um, who is a consultant to UN Habitat on climate change and environmental issues. So Alina, we are looking forward uh, to what you have to tell us. Thank you. I also have a You have also slides, so uh, yeah. please, yes, please yeah. move to the... Uh, to the computer, that is uh, possibly the, uh, uh, the the best one. And while you are uh, loading up your slides, I think uh, it would be very useful if we could, in our discussion, uh, perhaps reflect further on on uh, what was brought forward uh, by several speakers, as I said, but in particular by Andreas. 
how, um, on the one hand, disclosure information that is being regulated, at least in the European Union, and on the other hand, carbon credits could be given much more meaningful, you know, um, appearances, in particular when it comes to the environmental addition to the carbon, you know, that is in, uh, present in the market. I see Alina is ready. You have the floor, Alina. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. It's a pleasure to be with you, with many very knowledgeable uh, people. It's very interesting also for me to, to listen to the other interventions. So uh, maybe um, to start, I think my intervention will maybe take us back more to the urban scale. So following up uh, maybe on the intervention from Eduardo. And uh, so I will focus mostly on the interconnection between urbanization, uh, climate change and biodiversity and uh, providing also some examples of how nature-based solutions, nature-based urban regeneration can be, can be implemented at urban scale, and also looking at different types of financial approaches uh, to make this happen. And uh, I'm also going to provide some more project uh, examples, uh, so also to illustrate this uh, with local, local examples. And maybe to start, just uh, also to come back to this, uh, this interconnection you know, between different types of crisis that we experience today. It was also already mentioned by Benedetta in the, in the, in the introduction that there are different types of, of crises that are interconnected, like the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and I would also add the urbanization crisis to this. Um, and cities today, I think they face a, a dual challenge, so um, the biodiversity crisis but also the urban climate crisis and uh, urbanization intensifies um, in cities uh, in many areas. And uh, projections show that by 2050, 70% of the urban population, of the total population will be urban dwellers. And so urbanization has as consequence that uh, urban areas encroach also in natural areas. And this uh, poses a threat now to ecological connectivity, but also to ecosystem services provision. And in turn, it will have an impact on the vulnerability of urban areas. So that we see that really these different issues are very interconnected as well. And so I work at the planning finance and economy section. And so maybe to start, I, I wanted to highlight also the importance of urban planning uh, when we talk about uh, nature in cities and uh, also about finance because I think uh, urban planning is one of the first steps that we should consider also when we discuss about finance because it will have a direct impact on what is being financed in cities. And so I think uh, we can make a case maybe in three, three steps. So uh, I think first we need to acknowledge that it's important to have effective urban planning uh, mechanisms and processes in cities uh, for climate resilience. And second, uh, there is a need to mainstream uh, nature-based solutions and nature in general into urban planning uh, mechanisms and processes. And third, uh, so coming also to the topic of uh, today, is that we need to also integrate finance as an integral part of this planning process so that we also consider it from the start, from the assessment to the implementation, because today many cities still struggle to move from the planning phase to really implementing the plans at the local level. And so I'm going to start with one example from Mexico, where we worked with the city of San Nicolas de los Garza uh, on the development of a climate action strategy. And uh, this strategy was actually published this year. And uh, for the development of this climate action strategy, we developed a quite extensive diagnostic uh, at the local level. And um, as part of this diagnostic, um, and on the demand also from the municipality, we developed an analysis of the green and blue infrastructure of the, cis, uh, of the city and uh, also of the different ecosystem services that are provided by this infrastructure. And I think this example is uh, interesting because one of the first steps also when we discuss about uh, planning and finance is to understand what is the baseline condition no, of urban areas, what uh, spaces exist uh, at the current stage. And then from that, we can identify how can we improve the situation and where can we make specific investments in cities. And another concept that I think is linked uh, to the topic of today on uh, climate and biodiversity is uh, the concept of urban regeneration. Um, so uh, maybe it's also more linked to what was stated about uh, more nature in uh, everyone's backyard. Um, so it, for, 
the, the concept of urban uh, regeneration uh, that, uh, at UN Habitat, for us, it's uh, really as a, seen as a process and as a tool that contributes to inclusive and sustainable urban development, focusing uh, on uh, vulnerable communities specifically and also low-income neighborhoods. And um, so we look here at urban regeneration, I think we can look at uh, how we can preserve, uh, enhance uh, natural assets in cities and specifically in areas that are often under uh, deserved by uh, different uh, types of green spaces. And so here I wanted to provide one example from Nairobi, the Nairobi Rivers Regeneration Project. So in the case of Nairobi, actually 56%, it's estimated that 56% of the residents uh, live within uh, 30 meters of the city's three main rivers. And uh, these rivers form part of a wider basin, which is the Nairobi Rivers Basin. And in Nairobi, there's a high risk of uh, flooding to urban infrastructure and uh, residents. And uh, so UN Habitat has been working quite closely with the Kenyan government and also with lo local governments to address uh, this challenge. And so uh, we recognize, I think, that the rivers uh, provide important ecosystem services uh, to local populations. But in the case of Nairobi, we have different challenges, like pollution, for example, and degradation, that will have an impact on these ecosystem services. So I think what Eva mentioned earlier about this triple crisis, also about pollution, climate, and biodiversity, it uh, applies also to the case of, of Nairobi. And so um, why I'm talking about uh, this case is because um, in the case of the Nairobi River, for example, I think it can be seen as a good example of how urban regeneration of uh, one uh, specific natural infrastructure can uh, be also a catalyzer for sustainable urban development in general. And so because the Nairobi River, it really spans across the entire city of Nairobi. It's approximately 60 kilometers long and it also goes through many important uh, districts like the central business district. So um, if we think about uh, what could be the impact now of re regenerating such an important infrastructure, we can only imagine that it could have important consequences also on the entire city. And uh, I, uh, maybe also just to mention, I think uh, that was also mentioned, now the importance of partnerships. So when we look at regenerating such an important infrastructure, natural infrastructure, there is really a need to have a very strong partnership, bringing in many different experts with different expertise, but we also need uh, specific and diverse uh, financial mechanisms to finance this type of infrastructure. And so that brings me to another case I wanted to highlight. It's the case of the Equity Park project in Cancun in Mexico, um, also known as uh, Parque de la Equidad. Um, this is a project that was uh, developed uh, by uh, UN Habitat and uh, the focus was on developing a master plan to regenerate uh, the park uh, in Cancun and to also restore ecological uh, connectivity. And so in the case of this project, um, we can see here on the slide the, the park in green. And uh, what I think is interesting is that the project also took into account the different residential areas that were surrounding the park. And so um, what they call the zone of influence is actually the different uh, residential super blocks, uh, 48 in total, that were adjacent uh, to the, the park area and which amounted to a total of 2,000 hectares. And so the importance of this area is actually was taken into account because when we talk also about finance, uh, what was uh, proposed in the master plan was to implement um, different types of value, uh, land value capture mechanisms uh, so that the municipality could uh, um, get back, reco uh, recover part of the investment that would be needed to develop this urban uh, infrastructure. And I think so it's important when we discuss now about how uh, local governments can actually finance this type of uh, green infrastructure with the different types of benefits for the local population for climate adaptation mitigation, um, there is a need to, to identify what would be the most appropriate financial mechanism for this. And so, um, in addition, I think, to improving the conditions of the local residents, there is also a case that can be made uh, to say that uh, nature-focused interventions and policies 
can also contribute to um, sustainable growth in many regions. And uh, actually, there has been uh, uh, studies that have shown that ecosystem restoration, for example, creates uh, almost four times as many jobs as investment in other traditional uh, sectors and industries. Okay, I'm going to finish soon. <laughs> and just I wanted to highlight this uh, project very quickly. So it's the GoBlue project in Kenya, uh, which looks at uh, um, how to develop and uh, have a sustainable coastal growth. And this project has actually three components. So one focuses on environment, one on security, but one specifically on uh, growth. So I wanted to highlight uh, how this uh, aspect of economic growth is integrated into a project that actually focuses more strongly on uh, biodiversity and climate. And I think the approach is quite interesting and I wanted to highlight it because the approach of the project is to really uh, focus on what is already in place, what already exists in the area. So they work with different beach management units to provide them with competences and trainings, but also financing to preserve and restore uh, ecosystems. And then also what they do is in, in the planning process, they identify potential investments in infrastructure, like in the rivers, uh, to enhance, for example, access to water, and then that this could contribute uh, to developing agricultural activities in the region. So I think the approach is interesting because it focuses on existing infrastructure and services that exist, but on how to invest in them, to improve them, and to enhance uh, their potential for economic growth. And just to finish, I wanted to highlight, no, that was also, I think, highlighted by Eva uh, more on indigenous communities, but when we discuss about the the financing, it's important to discuss about the, the quality and the type of financing, but also who will access this type of financing. And so um, it's just to argue that I think today we also need to discuss on how we can enhance access of local governments and communities to uh, different financing mechanisms, including international climate finance, for example. Um, and I think that's also something we could uh, discuss more in detail. And today different climate financing mechanisms exist, like the climate funds but it's still very difficult for local governments to access this type of, of funding directly. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Alina. And um, I think you added another set of instruments on what we were discussing, and that is the whole area of land use planning and urban planning. I think that's a very important one to consider, in addition to all the policy instruments that were raised uh, so far. Now, Phoebe Konduri is supposed to be online, and I'm uh, curious to see whether technology <laughs> is going to work or whether technology is going to let us down. Uh, Phoebe, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. We don't see you yet, but I see that the technical staff is looking into that. Perhaps, Phoebe, you start, and I th I'm sure your picture is going to come through in a few seconds. Can you see my slides? No. Now you can, yes. right? Yes, now we see your slides. Okay, thank you, Phoebe. You have the floor. Okay. Can you hear me? We'll hear you loud and clear. And very we see good. your slides. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, very interesting panel on a very important issue. Um, I, it's amazing to see friends and colleagues, and uh, it is also important that we manage to integrate this uh, uh, concept, these issues of biodiversity conservation and regeneration in the uh, climate change debate. What I'm going to be showing today is an attempt to have a very holistic and integrated approach towards uh, design in decarbonization and, um, and climate resilient pathways, uh, both for the energy system, the land use system, the marine use system, and the transport system. So what I, I, I'm trying here to convey is that the issues of how we deal with land use, 
uh, uh, biodiversity, forestry, agriculture should be considered in a holistic framework with energy decarbonization and transport decarbonization in order to really give implementable uh, solution pathways to climate neutrality and resilience that make sense uh, to countries and at the end of the day, bring the change that we need. So today I will be showcasing the Global Climate Hub of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, a large network of more than 200, 2,000 institutional members across the globe. And, um, and I'm do hope that you can uh, hear me. I think you can. I am connected. 2,000 members across the globe with a hub in each and every member. And they initiated under the auspices of the General Secretary of the UN. Uh, what we try to do here is um, in collaboration with national governments and uh, representative stakeholders uh, at national level, design national and subnational pathways for climate resilience and neutrality, which means identifying the optimal dynamic mixture of technologies, policies, fiscal and financial instruments, and the uh, re required socioeconomic narrative in order to actually finance and implement by protecting the vulnerable populations these um, decarbonization pathways. I lead this alliance of excellence for research and innovation on IFORIA, including research and innovation centers, innovation acceleration hubs, science policy networks, and scientific associations and academies. In all of them, I have a, a leading or co-leading role, and our aim is to put together this uh, science driven, but also integrated enough and holistic pathways for the transformation we need. And this has to be done within the SDSN, um, within the Sustainable Development Solutions, uh, within the SDGs, which um, basically means that first we need to measure where we stand and uh, this is what we do every year. We measure across the globe in each and every country in sub-regions as well. What is the performance of each nation with regards to each SDG and with regards to each of the 169 targets within the SDGs, we definitely need to increase pace. You can see it on the left hand side on my map. Uh, the Phoebe, blue can I interrupt? Uh, sorry, Phoebe, to yes. interrupt. We lost your slides. Yes. And I'm given sign that you have to load them up from your end again. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I'm back again. So, and while you are doing Can you that. Them now? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Um, not yet. Now something is happening. And I have to apologize, Phoebe, before you started, I failed to introduce you. And of course, everybody knows you. Uh, you are a professor at, uh, in Athens and on several universities. You do important work at the UN and you are going to highlight that even further. But you are, above all, the president of the European Association of Resource and Environmental Economists. And I, my apologies that uh, I forgot to uh, mention that. So, Phoebe, I think we see something, but it's not yet entirely there. Um, I look at the technicians. And you know what? Let me let me give you the story without the slides. Exactly, that's perhaps the best, Phoebe. If you would uh, condense your story and okay. uh, bring it forward as clear as possible, apologies that uh, technology is letting us down. Don't worry. So the the important point that I am trying to make is that we need to have a very well-structured, science-driven approach in order to bring together the decarbonization and climate resilience uh, target uh, strategies and uh, pathways 
at national, subnational, but also international level for the four main systems of our economies. And these are the energy system, the um, land use system, the transport system, and the marine use system. Obviously, biodiversity is part of the land use system. So uh, what is uh, important here to understand is that um, as soon as we um, uh, start to work on a science-driven approach for the decarbonization pathways, we need measurements. We can uh, manage or improve anything without measurements. So the first thing we do in the Global Climate Hub of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which brings together a very holistic, integrated approach of these four systems, is that we measure where we are in each of these systems uh, in terms of the performance of each and every country and each and every sub-region of a country with regards to the 17 SDGs. Once we know where we stand uh, uh, against the 17 SDGs and the 169 targets within them, uh, using 250 KPIs, and you can see the UN SDSN report annually at the uh, the global report, the European report, the national reports, the national reports. As soon as we measure where we are, then we have enough uh, agreement in terms of the uh, initial uh, conditions in order to start working on the um, on the, uh, the on the pathways. Now, for the Global Climate Hub, it cons consists of nine different units. And these nine different units mainly showcase how one can go about in order to produce a holistic plan for climate uh, resilience and climate neutrality. The first one is climate data platforms and digital applications. And this basically um, is a uh, uh, a technical unit collecting, aggregating, connecting, visualizing the data, the socioeconomic and geospatial data that is needed for climate transition, climate transformation work. The second unit is on atmospheric physics, and there we work with IPCC in order to have the scenario of the physical variables. Then it's the energy and climate unit, and there we work with with a very systemic, holistic model, which is called the Palmora, which brings together energy supply, energy demand, climate policies, and simulation of uh, scenarios in order to understand how one can get to fit for 55, for example, what is the correct carbon pricing, and so on. And in COP, uh, I was there the first week, we, have, uh, we had the official launch of the first report of the uh, decarbonization pathways for the whole of Europe, the Balkans, the UK, and Southeast Asia. And next year, we will have the whole globe on map, showing what is the optimal mixture of energy sources and also where to locate the, their production and what are the corridors that are needed to transfer the energy from where it is produced to where it is consumed. Now, the next uh, part of the Climate Hub is the uh, land use uh, modeling. And here, here we use the FABLE calculator. This is a calculator that uh, focuses on agriculture and uh, land use and uh, also integrates uh, forestry and biodiversity. We work at the moment in more than 30 countries across the world, and we 
we simulate um, changes in livestock and crop productivity and health diets and agroecological practices and forestry practices and biodiversity conservation in order to achieve the global biodiversity targets, the food security targets and the climate mitigation goals by 2050. So here we have per country the management the optimal, let's say, management of the um, land use, land use change and uh, forestry, uh, including agricultural uh, practices and food safety. And then this um, uh, pathways, we softly integrate with the energy pathways, energy and transport pathways. And by softly integrating these um, uh, different systems of pathways, we end up with a very holistic and a very explicit and detailed um, plan for each and every country on how it should manage the uh, energy system, the transport system, the land use system, and the marine use system in order to achieve climate neutrality and climate resilience by 2050. And then the next unit is climate and health. So we integrate in this holistic framework the uh, uh, monetized effects of health, both physical and uh, uh, mental health of climate change. The next unit then adds its innovation acceleration. So in our pathways, we integrate new innovations that can achieve further cost efficiency in the production of energy, in climate resilience, in um, any aspect of the transition, which allows us to even increase the quality of the pathways. And then the um, uh, seventh unit is about the just transition. So now we have the optimal pathways for each and every country for the four systems, again, energy, transport, land use, and marine use. And then we calculate, we um, work on the socioeconomic narrative. Who pays with what finances, what instruments need to be put in place, and um, how we uh, um, uh, how we uh, support the vulnerable. And uh, this is uh, something that is indeed missing from the debate. Uh, so the climate hub came into existence because two or three, main issues were not in the debate of climate transition. The first one is that we traveled with uh, Professor Sachs in more than 120 countries. And what we've been told is that Okay, we know we need to do something about climate change. We see the increased frequency of extreme weather events. We see the catastrophic effects on human life, on economic activity, but we don't have detailed uh, uh, pathways to follow. We have uh, very upscale plans that are difficult to follow. So we thought we should focus on detailed national plans. The second thing was that the uh, decarbonization pathways of the energy and transport system and the uh, decarbonization pathways of the land use and marine system were not integrated. And the mitigation and adaptation attempts were not integrated. So we we integrated the, uh, all of these. And finally, what was missing was the socioeconomic narrative. Who pays and how? So, uh, and how you protect for the vulnerable. So the, here, we integrate all the system models, and in addition to all of them, we also 
um, do the socioeconomic analysis. And for example, in Europe, the socioeconomic analysis showcases that it is possible to create a package of measures uh, which mitigates all the negative uh, distributional effects from climate policies, mitigates all regressive effects, and it allows greater growth, more equality, and more employment. And this package of measures includes so, a lump sum transfers, targeted energy efficiency measures, job retraining programs, funding of subsidies of low carbon technology and uh, subsidies uh, that are biodiversity conserving. And of course, one issue that this transition unit, uh, this Hello, the Phoebe. Phoebe, can I ask yes. you to sum up because yeah. I get signals from the technical yes, team. I'm yeah, okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. So the, the, the last part of the uh, whole uh, discussion is um, how, how do you um, treat, how can you handle the uh, countries that do not have the fiscal space uh, to get involved in this uh, transition. So we have the pathways, we have the technologies, uh, we know that the money is there if you uh, engage blended finance, private and public finance, but we also know that the money is not available to the global south and even some uh, is not available for, her, so for some countries that are uh, de developed but do not have the fiscal space. So, um, sum up, uh, create... Phoebe. Yeah, can we sum up, please? Yes, uh, because we is, are really at the yes, end of the this session. Is the last, this is the last sentence. So, what, what we need here is uh, to transfer money uh, to the Global South and create fiscal space. We propose uh, two uh, ways to do that, uh, two, two aspects of restructuring in the global financial architecture. First, we need to tackle the high cost of debt and rising risk of debt distress by converting short-term high interest borrowing into long-term, more than 30-year debt, a lower interest rate, and of course, massively scale up affordable long-term financing for development, especially through public multilateral banks, multilateral development banks and aligning all financial flows with the SDGs. Doing all this and allowing uh, private finance, blended finance, will allow the fiscal space for everybody to invest in the transition. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Phoebe. Okay, well, I hate to say that we are very close to the end of our session, so uh, I would have hoped we uh, could go into some discussion, but I will not close the panel without giving anybody of you a one minute. You know, if you want to make a thought or a, uh, or a remark on what you heard from the other speakers. Shall I start with Simone? And we, we take the, the table as it is. Simone. Thank you. It should be working. Yes. You here, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, very briefly, thanks for the many interesting insights that you brought to the table. Just one reflection, given the time constraint. Um, many of you underlined the need to ensure financial flows to local communities. I think this is key, and as you said, there cannot be a choice between education and biodiversity, right? In this respect, and building up uh, upon what uh, Andrea was saying, the price low that we, the low price that we observe, I don't think can be just considered as a correction. Yeah. I think there is something more structural. In this sense, I think we should consider uh, a regulation that goes towards a minimum price, and this uh, addresses the problem of bringing money to the financial, to the local communities. Thank you, Simone. A very interesting thought. Minimum floor to favor local communities. Eva. 
Um, I, I think I tend to agree with uh, what, what Phoebe said, is that we do need to look at the uh, transformation of the um, uh, financial architecture and really support these vulnerable countries uh, with high debt um, in uh, achieving that fiscal space. One of them also looking at um, deferring debt service uh, through, um, for c in case of climate emergencies and natural disasters. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, without uh, wanting to say that the, 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 the perfect should not suffer from the, uh, or rather the, uh, the imperfect should not uh, suffer from the perfect, I, I think it's important when we talk about these nature-based solutions to use evidence to understand the limits that they have. And it's good to be ambitious and it's good to, uh, to talk about win-win or triple-win uh, solutions, but also understanding the, the constraints that these uh, instruments have is, is uh, I think it's more sincere uh, and a more viable way forward. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to open up the debate on the constraints, but there is no time. Uh, moving to Eduardo. Uh, I think that uh, voluntary markets uh, uh, should survive, uh, but I think it's uh, very important that there is some sort of financial regulation because actually they are financial instruments. Absolutely, an important point. And Alina? Thank you. Yes, maybe just um, based on what I've heard, I 